following me so far? The second thing I also want to do is make sure that we flip this iceberg. So the things that we are actually doing behind the scenes are, some, are things that are not secret. They're very open. They're very transparent around what's going on and why we do the things we, we do. So there is no question. I think a lot of times when, um, when you see or read different things in the newspaper, you see that I don't comment on a lot of things because I don't want that to be a space where you don't get to hear directly from me. So that's why I flipped the iceberg this way. So I'm glad you're here tonight. So with that said, there's a bunch of systems that make us work. Um, there are a bunch of things that uh, help us operate and move in a direction that makes sense. However, at the same time, there's, a, there's uh, two pathways we could go down as we think about building a system to create the change we want to see. One of the most notorious systems to be underperforming or ones that do not work is this place. Right? All of you either chuckled or laughed or have an experience about what happened when you went to the BMV, right? So I had experience doing that too, very recently, and actually it was earlier today, where I said, just walk me through the process of getting uh, new license plates and new tags, right? And so here's what happened. True story, everything in here is a true story. I went online, Googled, I had to call three, three BMVs, uh -oh. three BMVs, the first three got, busy signal. Got no one, no answer. I got to the fourth one, and once I got to the fourth one, they told me that I needed to call a different number. So I finally got a person, they told me to call a different number. I called the fifth place, and they told me, okay, here's what you need to do. First, you have to go to the title office, and then come back to the BMV to get this paperwork, and then come back to us to verify what the other office said. Then, the t after that, I called again another office, and they said, once you have all that done, we can give you your tags, but we can't give them to you because after today, we're closed for six weeks, <laughs> right? I wouldn't say that's an effective system, fair? Yeah. On the other side, hospitals. When we think about the care of hospitals and the purpose of hospitals, is it is to make us better. Now, don't, I won't say these are perfect systems, but I will say that they're improved compared to the story that I just gave you. Um, this gentleman um, was a doctor in 1846 who was trying to improve our hospitals by doing something very simple. He was a, a, a doctor who was helping with childbirth and, and when women were coming into the world with their young person, he was a doctor going to the field to deliver babies. He was delivering babies, babies at a hospital while midwives were delivering babies at home. But he found very quickly that kids were dying in hospitals at a rate, I'm sorry, parents, uh, mothers were dying at a uh, hospitals at a rate of five times faster at a hospital than with a midwife. He didn't understand why that was happening, so he said, what, what is it that's causing this? And he realized very quickly that the medical, um, the doctors and the people that were training in hospitals were learning about child bed fever, which were killing the mothers, by looking at the cadavers of the mothers that had passed. And what was happening is when they were doing that with those uh, deceased mothers, they were getting things underneath their nails and then delivering babies. And the only reason, and the only way that he found that out is because he then started to find that people, mothers weren't the only people dying of childbed fever. It was actually people that came in contact with it. And he said, you know what? We need to wash our hands. His simple solution to all of this was to wash, his, wash our hands. But the reality of the situation is even though they were washing their hands, they still were a lot like this system because people didn't buy in. They didn't believe that washing their, your hands would actually help the situation for mothers. And until they were actually to improve and believe that it was possible that washing your hands would be the difference, they became a stronger institution. <laughs> Why do I bring this up? I think about our kids and what we're trying to do every single year, and that is to get our kids to a place in this world to be successful in life post high school. But here's the current reality in our schools. I had a chance to dig into a whole bunch of numbers and find out about um, a scenario and this is an isolated scenario of an individual that I'm pointing out, but this is indicative of a larger number of kids who are seniors right now. A portrait of a scholar in uh, uh, the high school right now is this. Nine out of nine state tests that this individual has taken, and again, this is an individual that re is repeated multiple times over. Nine out of nine tests, state tests they have taken, they have been identified as limited on every single one. 23 times between 2013-14 and this present year, they were given a D or an F. This person currently has a 1.0, but has 15 credits and is slated to graduate. 
something doesn't work. That system doesn't quite make sense to me. It sounds like this one, right? So when you think about all the things that we're trying to do right now, it is to make sure that narrative, that portrait, becomes something different. And more about what this gentleman was trying to do in hospitals and getting people to wash their hands. Now the difference is now people realize the importance of washing their hands. They've huddled up, they put their hands together, they realize, no pun intended there, they put their hands together and realized we collectively have to make this difference. So if you were to go in a hospital today, you would be hard pressed to find uh, a space where you don't see that in that red circle, a place where you can have hand sanitizer or some kind of things to clean your hands. How many people have been in a hospital and seen those everywhere? Because as, as you realize this, as this person walks further and further and further down the hall, they're touching something, someone, something that is gonna make a person sick or make them better. They better have clean hands doing that. That's the same thing for the work we do as our kids move from step to step to step closer to graduation. We have to make sure we're taking the right precautions to make them successful. That's our why. So the experience we had last year when we were all down in Columbus and having a good time and we were in the same huddle celebrating our kids on the basketball court, it's time to celebrate our kids in the classroom and put everything else behind us. And here's how we're going to do it. First, experience joy. So earlier this year, we had a teacher convocation, um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And I might be a little bit biased, because I had a lot of fun. And teachers that were there, a lot of them also had a lot of fun, because it was an experience. And school leaders had a lot of fun doing this, because it was a chance for us just to be ourselves, and to experience joy in a way that I actually, to be very honest, and school leaders are sitting, some of them are sitting here now, I didn't know they were going to bring it the way they did. I mean, there were shirts, there were chants, there were skits. It was amazing to see how many people were just there to celebrate their school the first day collectively. It was powerful. And they realized in that moment, in that time, we realized this quote to be true. Like if we're ever going to accomplish anything we need to do, it's going to be collectively. Regardless of how you feel or, or maybe the, the sentiment you might have or something that might be bothering you, we have to come together. So here's how we can do that. So this is a slide from last year, a promise that I made to you all. I will always bring you the information that you need at the time that I can and with honesty and integrity. Anything that I tell you will be honest, driven by data and honest to its core. So here's some things that we'll talk about. We'll talk about instructional updates first. We'll go to managerial things and then into operational things, starting academically because that's what we're here and what we're about. I'll go very quickly through number one and number two, but number three has some depth because I know this is something that has been brought up and concerns that have been uh, laid around scholar behavior, and then of course, um, standard-based grade. So academic uh, academy development, this is something just to re rehash where we ended the la uh, last year. We had a conversation around our transition as a high school from our old traditional 9th through 12th grade model to eventually getting to a space of having all full academies. And in short, all I'm calling out here is that this year we have Titan Academy, we have a Success Academy, and we have our uh, 10, 11, and 12th grade, like traditional 10th and 11th and 12th grade, with the intent that next year, as we start to grow this out, we'll have more and more of our academies put in place. In particular, arts and media and civic engagement and social justice academies will be put in place next year. So I pull this out because by 2021, 22, we want to see that ninth grade class, no pressure, pressure uh, Brian Hilko, um, as you just walk in. Um, but that ninth grade class is the first class that we're expecting all of them to walk across the stage, receive a graduation diploma, um, and then also receive an associate's degree or industry credential four years from now. That is the first class that will have that experience in totality. With that said, we need help doing that. We need help having conversations around what that looks like. Last year, I proposed these four pictures to you and the, the process we'll go through. The brainstorming stage, we're gonna plan, we'll incubate, and then we'll actually go. The first phase and the thing that's most important for those that are in this room, we need help brainstorming and planning. We're right where we need to be to start planning for next year around, uh, around these academy models. The first thing we will need and to, will do, and we actually will have a trip uh, middle of October to see our first excellent school. We're actually traveling to uh, Idea Public Schools in San Antonio to see some uh, public schools who are doing great things and are performing at a high level. That's our, our first step. Our second step is finding experts locally who are able to help build out those models. For example, the Arts and Media Academy, we've had already some initial conversations with Oberlin um, to help us think through what this model could look like. 
um, and looking for other, uh, other folks you might know who might help us be the brains behind those de the development of those models, and then getting community buy-in and involving our scholars in this process. That's where I need all of your help um, to get to with the brainstorming stage. So the next few weeks, there'll be some emails coming from the MAC team um, to start the process of thinking through what those academies should, will, and could look like um, so that we can get to a space 12 weeks, I'm sorry, eight weeks from now for the next 12 to 16 weeks to just plan. Just to make sure the plan is right, uh, make sure that Mr. Garvey and his team feel prepared for the following year in the rollout of these academies and then be prepared to be successful um, with those academies. Second piece here is the laptop rollout. Um, you see a picture here of a scholar and their mother. Uh, the mother is probably more excited here, as you can see in this picture, than maybe the scholar, um, getting their laptop. The intent of getting uh, laptops to our kids originated from two things. One, uh, it is in my heart um, and in my soul that none of our kids get anything less than any other child in America. My dad teaches in a, a district, one of the most affluent districts in Pennsylvania called Tradition East, um, and it is just outside of Philadelphia, if you know anything about Philadelphia, called the Main Line. So the Main Line has million dollar homes and very wealthy kids and parents go to the school. And every kid in that school goes to not just college, they go to Harvard, they go to Yale, they go to the best schools in Pennsylvania <laughs> because of all the things they're afforded along the way. One of those things is technology. I hate the fact that our kids, just because of where they, their zip code lands and where they are born, that they don't have these resources. So the intent of getting these resources in their hands was to make sure that we can say our kids too have those resources, we just now have to figure out, what, make sure we're using those resources right. But we weren't gonna stop to make sure, we weren't gonna stop because um, our kids don't have the resources, they need them. But here in the slide you see the number of laptops that have been picked up by grade. Uh, we still have a bunch of laptops that haven't been picked up at this point. So if you know a, a parent or a scholar and a parent who haven't picked up their laptop, just remind them there's a few more days coming up where they can still pick up their laptops. We've had 11 different days, including a Saturday, where a great team of folks, uh, some of them are here, who are here for hours, just getting 1,000, 1,000 or so folks came in to get their laptops. So there, are, there have been 11 days so far to get your laptop, and there's a few more still to go. With that said, again, this is all in preparation, getting our kids prepared to be successful in life. Here's the other challenge with this. This young man is very excited after graduation um, and should be. The challenge is we realize that is the focus and where we should be focusing our attention. Um, I typically do not and usually do not cover your ears, Rick and Katie. I don't read the paper. Because there's a lot of things that are put in the paper that you just can't listen to, right? Whether you believe it or not, it's just hard to listen to. I choose not to because I, I have a ton of things that I need to get done, right? The other piece is, there are stories that are told in the paper, there are stories, uh, stories that are put in, in different avenues that are factually inaccurate. And it's not the fault of these wonderful media outlets, let me be clear, it's not them, it's the, where they're getting potential information from. So I wanna set the record straight with the information, especially around scholar behavior. Over the past few days, um, there have been, to recap, there have been a few things. Um, the gift and the curse of these things that fly around, uh, Make a, make a lot of information travel. Uh, and it's interesting how many people, um, which I love them dearly, would never express uh, who they are, who send me, hey, Hardy, you should know this, or you should see this, because it's popping up in these places, right? Uh, I don't have Facebook. I just refuse to go on it. Um, the only thing I do is tweet. Uh, Instagram, it's confusing. I don't know what to do with those filters. And Snapchat, I heard your pictures disappear, so why would I use it? So I get information from other folks. But at the same time, the information that is being provided is unfortunately providing a slant to a situation that's just not fair and not focused on kids. And then it creates headlines like this. War Channel 19, who said this? Now, I'm not, I'm not knocking down the comments that are coming from uh, those individuals who believe that to be true. I just want to make sure they have the truth. Is that fair? Because that's what they perceive. Let's just make sure we have the truth. So with all that said, in, in complete honesty, we have had fights at our high school. Absolutely have had fights. There's no denying that. There's no denying that we have to and are continuing to improve the quality of the learning environment in our high school. However, what is not true is that it is out of control. That is not true. Now here's a few examples of that to make sure you understand and see. 
very hard to read this, this table, but I gave you a snapshot here of the past three years of suspensions throughout the district. Please take your time, I'm gonna leave this slide up for a while. Take a picture, whatever you need to do. The last three years of suspensions at in Lorraine. 2015, 2016, elementary, middle, high, and alternative academy. So that, that changed over time a little bit from uh, credit recovery and new beginnings and all those things. So we just label that as alternative academy. So you see 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017, 2017, 2018, which was last year, and then this current year. Then you also notice that it's broken down by quarter of each year. So when you think about a grading period, about nine weeks is a quarter. So you see each quarter how many um, out, out of school suspensions occurred. Now, if I can, I think I left the piece of paper over here. I'll let you digest that for a second. Hopefully it's not an eye chart, but it gives you some context and data. The last column I put over here, because I actually was curious to see the rate at which kids were getting suspended per day, so we have 178 days in the school year. So this last column actually gives you the average of students suspended per day at a school by grade level, okay? So if I'm in elementary school in 2015, 2016, on average, there was 1.9 scholars suspended per day in 2015, 2016, as you move down the sheet. So the narrative right now says that this is true. The reality of the situation, when you actually add up the numbers and see the number of out-of-school suspensions, you will see, right down here, the first quarter and the first four weeks, we've had six out-of-school suspensions in elementary, 25 in middle school, 28 in the high school, and in our alternate uh, academy, five. Five. If you look at this time last year, I'm sorry, this time after the first quarter uh, in those four areas, elementary had 114. Middle school, 118. High school, 164. And at our alternative academy, 96. 2018, the numbers are there. Now you're probably saying, okay, that's after nine weeks, Mr. Hardy. That's not a full semester. That's not, a, I'm sorry, that's not a full quarter. Completely understand. Hence why I did the average by day. Second, if, if you were just to say we're about the halfway mark, or I would give, it, give you credit, like we're only 40% of the way there, and you add or double plus five to each of those numbers, we're still about 50 to 60% less as far as suspension-related uh, offenses in our schools. So when you hear that number, what is your reaction now? Different? The same? Not as bad as what I mean. Not as bad as bad. saying it is. No, not, or not the bad. behavior is still there, but the punishment is the not suspension? Well, that's a good point. Thank you for yeah, bringing that up. Yeah, yeah. So here it is, if you could. I, yes, I'm a parent, and I'm for my child to be suspended if they break the rules. So here is, if you don't mind, thank you for bringing that up. There was a question on the back of that. that that's actually the data from 2018, 2019 that also codes fights and other incidents, right? So on that sheet, can you just read the, the one that says coded for fighting there? Yes. Elementary school, zero. Middle school, 10. High school, 18. Alternative academy, three. Three. So that actually breaks down the number that were just fights and the other offenses. So to your question, I heard you say, well, they're not getting caught for the other things going on. They are, because we actually separated in that second column, the fights from everything else are getting suspended for. Even with that, the numbers are still well below. Because you're lowering your standards mm -hmm. as far as mm -hmm. the punishment and the, the punishment, the punishment meaning the reason. you're lowering your standards, not you. Okay. I feel it schools are <laughs> lowering their standards. Say what you mean by standards. As far as Interesting. I mean, Interesting, because here's the reality, though. That's a great point. So some folks are saying, okay, so now you're lowering expectations and saying, you know what, you're letting things slide. So you're lowering things, you're saying that things are, you're just putting things on the rug is what I hear you saying, right? So if that's the case, 
those coded fights, if you're to go even a little bit deeper, and I'm glad that uh, Mr. Harvey's here and, and folks from the high school, we've actually suspended kids for not even physically fighting. We've suspended kids because they verbally got into an altercation that we thought would turn into a fight. So in my mind, I actually think we're shifting that and saying we're actually being more stringent on expectations and making sure that our kids are accountable for things they're doing before they fight. And where is anger management coming into? Anger management as far as? As far as the children getting suspended or targeting. Great question. So earlier this week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I sent out a letter to the community. If not, let's put it on the website, Mac team, if it's not already up. In the letter, bottom paragraph, it talks about restorative justice. If you click on that link, that actually gives you all the steps we're taking to ensure that that anger management, those challenges that our kids are facing, are actually addressed after their suspension. Fair? Other questions? Yes. I, I'm not very familiar with your charting or anything like that, and, and I appreciate how you separated the fighting from the other incidents. Um, I actually have a special needs six-year-old little boy that was suspended today for being autistic and they wrote that he he did something autistic. So my son's removed until Monday. Gotcha. And it was because your staff couldn't control or help or handle him. So if we have kids that are fighting, yeah, that, that's a problem. That anger management needs to be addressed. But I, I have a child that's suspended because the staff didn't know how to deal with him. And they even circled because he's autistic. May I? Yes. So I will say two things. So I don't know if you were able to hear that, ma'am. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Anger management needs to be addressed while they're being suspended, not afterwards. Gotcha. So I hear two, th I just so want. There's, I, there's a lack of time. Yeah. So they're being suspended longer now not only maybe three or six days, they're, they're being, <coughs> what's happening in that time period as right. far as That's a great question. managing them or their anger management or, I mean, academically, what's happening to them? They're right. out of school. Right. So the, I, I hear a couple different, it kind of is a circuitous question, so I want to try to answer all parts. Mm -hmm. But I also just want to show you the opposite side, right? So we are taking suspensions very seriously, which was your first concern. And unfortunately, this is kind of some of the byproduct, which isn't fair in that sense, but we, are good, we have good people here that will help answer this, and I think I saw Doreen come in, and she can have a conversation with you to speak very specifically with you about this. So with that said, that's the duplicity of that. But to your other part, so what happens when a kid is suspended, right? What have, why aren't we getting them help while they're on suspension? We, we can, we absolutely will. The problem is, that's part of the punishment, is being away from the learning environment for the things that you put uh, in place or you put out there that endanger 2,000 other kids. I cannot afford to have a, a young person fight and, not, and be in that school and for 2,000 kids and families be dependent on the safety of their kids because of a bad choice that young person's making. And hence why we make that choice. Once they serve that suspension, reflect, that's when they go into our restorative practices. So if you click, I don't know, have you seen the letter? So if you could, okay, so let's, I don't know if we can, can we pull the letter, if we can find the letter, we'll get you a copy before you leave. Okay, 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 so, okay, and those, those are the things we need to hear, so I thank you. I thank you for bringing those to the forefront. If you could, before you leave, if it, someone, Elena, can you just go over there and grab this scholar's name and the school? Just grab it real quick from her. We'll get you the letter and we'll follow up with that principal for you. Okay? Miss Lee. Yes. May I say something? And I, and I of understand you where everyone is coming from. But let's get to the root cause of the problem of our children. And let's get down, particularly, I want to deal with that elementary level. We have children who are coming in realizing that 85 to 80 percent of our children in our school system are multicultural. Let's face that truth, number one. Uh, hold on. Miss Lee, try. Here you go. I know you don't like the one. <laughs> no. Let's face and look at some of the root causes of why our children are behaving the way they are with the fights. Number one, let's face it, there's a number of things that, you know, I feel that 
can be and should be done. Number one, particularly when our kids begin to enter into kindergarten, preschool, or prior to, there should be resources, and hopefully there will be resources available to those kids and those families. Another thing that we need to deal with as a root cause is parental accountability. We cannot just say it's the teacher's fault or the child's fault. We have children who are coming into our schools daily traumatized for whatever reason, whatever their environment may be at home prior to, if they're hungry, whatever. But do we have someone, whether the teacher or whoever, to say good morning or have the resources available in there to help that child? Because that child will let you know. Sometimes it's through fighting and their behavior. Other times it may be because they want you to hear them and they want to, you to understand, and we don't. Simply because we don't know. And we don't have the resources available there for our children. Another is that we need to make the parents, whoever they might be, whatever that situation may be, to embrace them and have them to come to our school so that we can deal with our children at that village who really cares because the kids want to know who they are. Many of them are asking the question, who am I? When you were, say, five, six years old, did you ever question who you were, where you came from, what your feelings were at that particular time? It's even more prevalent now in this day and this society. And my hope is that we all come together and that we do have the resources available. And like the lady saying, we do not have them. Many of our kids are coming in who have problems with you, and I can sympathize with the autistic child. I have a great grandchild who's autistic. These things have to be addressed, not tomorrow, not next year, but now, today, when those kids begin to enter. The other thing, because of our multicultures, do we have classrooms where, say, say in kindergarten, you say, good morning, how are you? And the child next to him say, say good morning in Spanish, and you have that other child to say it back in English, where they can interact with one another and to know that they have to live into a society here in the city of Lorraine, and I love my city. But I know that there are problems that need to be addressed, and it's not just on one level. And I think that, as the lady says, the standards, what needs to be done, and it needs to be addressed, and particularly beginning when the first day that child steps foot into school, or prior to, to know where it's coming, and to get these parents. First question to all of you, how do we get all of these parents engaged? I don't agree with many of them. I don't like what's doing. I don't like how I see my children coming to school, because they're all mine. And I think this is what we have to do, and we have to get those resources, Dr. Harvey, out here in this community that's available, we're getting funded to come into our schools and to help us with our children. May, may I say to you, Ruth, quick? I really don't want to have to embarrass myself or no. say too much, no. but uh, last year my son was a kindergartner, and he got, I believe, one of the highest scores in the state of Ohio on your testing. Mm -hmm. I am a parent brought to my knees because I am here. I am trying to do whatever it takes to I, I agree with you because I have a I am here who's autistic. And, and I have a bright young man. I don't have the resources to keep them in the right district. Yes, we do. We so, do have them. So they are there. I know they're there. So let me say two things. I'm a strong parent. My son is not doing, he is not un unattended. My son is, <coughs> is not practicing bad behavior. And, I, and I'm not saying your daughter is. I'm, you're, you're here too. So I, I am a very strong parent and, and I'm trying to be involved. In, I was told that I can't go past the office anymore. I can't observe. I can't help my son in the classroom. So my, my son right now is being traumatized. He's practicing behaviors that I'm fearful of. 
So the good, the, um, one, thank you for being here because that says a lot about how strong and how caring you are as a parent, right? Mm -hmm. That says a lot. Um, two, that earlier picture of us huddling and putting all our hands together, you have a village here that wants to support you and help you. Specifically, I'm looking at Doreen, and I'm specifically looking at Jay, who can connect with you right now um, so that we can get to the resources and a couple of principals that are here as well. So we want to get answers for you. So Jay, do you mind just taking mom out for a second and just having a conversation on what she can get support on? Okay, thank you. With, with that said, um, again, I wanna just highlight the, the difference, the narrative that we see around our suspensions and what the reality is, right? The narrative that we see in the paper and what is actually true about suspensions and the numbers that are, are exhibited. The second piece too is I, I always worry about um, perception, you know, numbers are one thing, but what does it really look like? You know, the narrative of, you know, it's, it's out of control and there's, there's just no order in any way. Um, it's troubling because, uh, you know, Mr. Garvia, you know, I, I, he probably, I'm in his building more than he probably wants me to be. Um, uh, partially because I, I love walking the halls and I love being around our kids and seeing who they are. And I've been lucky enough to build some really cool relations with, with some of them who are just wanting to mislead to your point, someone to talk to. And, and some of the things that you hear and see with them are there, there are a lot of caring adults around them. Today was a big day, it was a lot of caring adults that made a big difference for our school and for our city and for our district. And it felt really good to see how many adults did. It's also interesting to note um, that there are a, a number of kids who are still asking for more adults to care. One young man I had, uh, was in the cafeteria with one day, um, a lot of you know him and I think I can share his nickname because you won't know his first name, but Slim, um, in the cafeteria, so I see some chuckles, you know Slim. Slim usually stays by himself and, and is with himself in many ways. Um, and uh, one day he looked frustrated, so I just went up to talk to him and see what was going on. And Slim said, you know, I, I, I was tardy. I hated being tardy. I don't want to be tardy. He had band first grade, so he didn't want to miss band. And I, I, I said, what help? I mean, so he's like, stop spending so much money on making us, you know, when we're tardy, getting us in trouble, right? Because we get in trouble for being tardy. And I said, so Slim, what would you want us to, money, to spend our money on? He said, spend the money on getting more adults to care about us. His words, not mine. So, we have to think about that. And it's not, he said adults. He did not say teachers. He said adults. Everyone in the building, everyone throughout the district, he wants more adults that care about him. The other piece was that was interesting. I, I pulled Eric, is Eric here? Eric, about 9, 10, I came to him. I said, you know what, before we go into town hall, I actually want us to just go over to the high school, unannounced, and video clip a minute of what goes on. Unadulterated, here it is. And part of me was like, make it good, please, in my head, right? Because I didn't know what was gonna happen. But I also had confidence, the work that's being done at the high school, that it was gonna be good. So me, I mean, Eric, honestly, I honestly said, can we go do this? And he said, sure. Wasn't preempted, not planned, but I trusted what was going on, that would be fine. So here's what was going on, let me show you. Now, being the perfectionist that Eric is, he actually put a little music and a little slide at the end because he's, he's artistically talented. But the raw picture and image that you'll see was just a random minute at around 9, what was it, Eric, about 9.50 or something? I don't know, uh, this morning.
What did you all see? Crowded, Crowded high school walk into class. Kids in school. What else? Smiling, right? What else? Interacting with one another. Interacting with one another. Saying hello. Wanting attention from the camera. <laughs> Wanting attention from the camera. Yes, that is true. That is true. Just trying to get to class. Just trying to get to class, right? The other piece that I loved in here, which it was around 40 seconds or so, I don't know if you caught it, where there was a moment of a scholar and teacher get a little fist bump, yeah. right, to show that they care about each other, right? Like those little things go a long way when you talk about the culture that is being created at the high school. It's really powerful. That is probably the busiest hallway, like that where it started is the busiest hallway in Lorraine High, that T there, so you got to see like the raw data of what's going on in a transition, right? As we were going down the hallway, I also want to point out which was a point of concern, and I think might have been a point of shared concern at some other point recently, around this point right here. This hallway leads to Success Academy. And there's been a lot of concern around mayhem happening at Success Academy. That was it. In that section, that's Success Academy. Questions? Sure. Okay, so I want to move on. I spent a lot of time there because I think it's very important. When I was lucky enough to be um, hired for this role, folks often commented about Lorraine and, and uh, how, you know, what are you thinking going to Lorraine and everything, is, the sky is falling in Lorraine. And um, I actually, uh, earlier this week, uh, one of our high school scholars cut my hair. Um, uh, yep, he sure did. Look, I'm, I'm still here. I'm in front of you, so it must have been okay. Uh, but no, he's he's actually a really good a really good barber. So I, I went to his home studio. He cut his. I was like, you have a home studio? This is wow, this is fancy. I never should be coming here a lot longer. But anyway, he was cutting my hair, and he had a friend from Elyria there, and we were just talking. She had no idea who I was, none. We were just talking. I said, so why why do you go to school in Elyria? She said, well, you know why. You're from around here. All the fights that happen and all the craziness that happens every single day. I was like, and so tell me what goes on, because I don't know. I don't see it. Yeah, there's fights. And, and like the other day, I heard there were 17 fights in a day. And, and every seventh period, there's this and that. I'm like, oh, wow. We probably should tell the CEO about this. <laughs> um, but the reality is that's the unfortunate narrative that was here when I first arrived, and unfortunately that's the narrative that is out here, but this is the truth. It's a lot different than what people believe. I put these three tweets up here to go back, to circle back to the social media aspect of it all. The reality of media and social media and how things get out, oftentimes the, the flashy, um, the negative, seems to get the instant attention. But I actually did a little research on the top three tweets in 2017, the ones that stuck, and the ones that people love the most, these are the top three. One is actually funny. If you ever follow Wendy's, Wendy's is hilarious to follow on Twitter. Um, but this is a person who said, how many retweets would I need to have to get free nuggets? 18 million was the response from Wendy's. That was number one, the number one followed and favorite tweet. <laughs> and number two was a picture of Barack Obama who was talking to some kids, sharing love. Number three, is talking about what Penn State was going to do to provide funding for families that were um, struck by the hurricane that hit Houston. So I bring this up because even though the flashy narrative, the quick piece that people pick up is negativity in the short term, in the long term, love absolutely conquers all. Every single time. So that's why we do what we do. Standard based grading. The other big question has been, what are we going to do differently to make sure our kids are getting the education they deserve? Right, ma'am? I think you were alluding to some of those pieces. One of the big shifts we are trying to make is to ensure that our kids are getting what they need to be successful. Three things that are true. We realized that in the past, the story that I illustrated a little bit earlier was of a young person who has been pushed along through the system and is now in a place to graduate and will leave undereducated by the fault of a system of years of a system from top to bottom, everyone in between, 
they have been failed. Standard-based grading actually fundamentally makes us think about teaching and learning differently. Forces us to do things differently than we have in the past and teach to a standard in which the state says we must meet. The second piece standard-based grading does for us, we all have been in a classroom, those that have been teachers have seen kids in a classroom who are absolutely wonderful. Nicest kid in the class, come in and say hello to you, sit in the back of the room and chill out. They don't pick up a book, they don't pick up a pencil, they just hang out. They sit in the back and at the end of the quarter, they get an A. Why? Because they didn't disrupt class, they didn't cause any hassle, they get an A. Standard-based grading forces us to separate that grade out so they're getting a grade for their behavior, for their effort, and for their academic performance. So a young person now will walk out and say, you know what? And better yet, a parent can walk out and say, you know what, academically, you know, you're struggling here. But your effort's good. Your behavior's good. Or the other way around, man, you're really smart, but can you get it together on the behavior side? Versus when they got one grade, it became blended into one number. And that one number would hide some things that we have to work on for our kids. So these three numbers, and they're numbers intentionally, are to show how our kids are mastering standards, how they're, um, how they're performing effort-wise, or they're giving us forth effort, and then, of course, their behavior. And we put it on a scale of one to five because it aligns with the state's way of state testing. So from limited to basic, proficient, so on and so forth. Parents, you will get a, a mini handbook that kind of gives you the breakdown of how this looks, but that's the intent behind standard-based grading. It'll look something like this once you receive it, um, so you can actually see how your kids are performing in grades with those three markers, and ultimately, your hope is to ensure that kids that now graduate, we can feel better about when they walk across the stage that there are standards that are mastered that will prepare them for real life. <coughs> and understand that there's things that we need to push on and get better. So that situations like this stay in the past. Do not remain to be the reality. We no longer can accept kids that are limited, give them 15 credits, and then send them out the door and say, congratulations, you graduated high school. And expect them not to do something that is a detriment to our country and to our city. That's standard-based grade. Going to move on to managerial things. Any questions around instructional? Yes, Ms. Lee. Yes. My question is uh, to you. Um, are we seeing to it that each one of our scholars at our council, our parents are coming in with the counselors and they will know where they are in each grading period or each year prior to getting into middle school and high school? It's a great question. My honest answer is no. We're not to the degree that we need to, right? Um, I think there's some of that going, but not to the degree I hear you asking us to do. However, we had a great meeting on Friday. Um, so the question was, are we meeting with parents around where kids are along the way, all of our kids to make sure they understand? We had a great meeting on Friday to initiate and understand those pain points, hence why this slide is there. Um, so I thank the team that put the data together that allowed us to see where our kids were. But it raised the question for us, who is going to be that graduation guardian for each one of our kids? Right. Who is going to be the person who is ensuring that not only just their senior year, I mean, I love the fact that the data went all the way back to our current ninth graders. So this process begins when they enter our building in ninth grade to make sure they're getting the support they need through 12th. And Nancy and I actually had an ad hoc conversation today about 13th and 14th year uh, of education. So when they leave us in high school, we still don't let them go yet. And so we want to figure out how to support them along the way. Josh, cover your ears. It might cost a couple extra dollars. <laughs> he doesn't like that part. But I do know Josh would support the fact that it is for our kids. Any other questions? Structural stuff. Cool. Managerial side, I'll go relatively quick. Um, updates around uh, managerial pieces. Uh, the teacher, teacher incentive was something we, tr we attempted and proposed to a group of uh, teachers. We're still waiting on the teachers union just to get, it, get back to us and see if they accept the, the idea. Um, so we're just waiting on their vote, to be quite honest. Um, so what I'm showing you is a proposal of what we gave out to our teachers. Because here's the, the reality. Last year alone, um, our teachers missed about 8,000 days. 8,000. Average teacher missed about 18.6 days, which equivocates to about a month, right? That forced us in our budget to build out a budget of a million dollars for substitute coverage. So sub coverage alone we budgeted for about a million bucks. Is that fair? 
a little bit over. We were prepared for that. We said, though, we want our teachers with our kids every single day. We'd rather have our teachers than a substitute, because as we know, and I'll be the first to raise my hand, when there was a substitute in class, whoo, game time, right? Literally, right? So it's better to have our great teachers in our class every single day. So we said, you know what? What if we incentivized our teachers first and make sure that they were given some additional dollars to make sure that they are there every single day? And this is what we had come up with, realizing that our teachers also were serving on a couple of different committees, um, which cost us another quarter of a million dollars. Um, so when you put these two pieces together and realize that we can now have weekly data meetings built into the day, we have our data days that happen every second Tuesday, and we have PD days three times a year, we can get all of those teams in play, save the $265,000, um, roughly uh, $270,000, and we have about a million and a quarter to spend differently. And we said, why don't we try to incentivize? Start with teachers, not end with teachers. Let me be clear, we want to address all other uh, membership and, and unions as well over time. But starting with teachers giving those numbers, and we said, you know what, let's, oops, let's incentivize our teachers and give them $2,000. If you come every single day, 2,000 extra bucks. If you miss less than three days, we'll give you 1,500 extra bucks. If you miss uh, less than five days, 1,000 bucks. That's the proposed plan to keep our teachers and getting our teachers there every single day. Just again, waiting for ratification from the teachers union, which I'm hopeful will happen. We then said, we can't stop there because there's a lot of great people that do great work across this district. We realize how hard, and you, I mean, you've seen and been to our beautiful buildings. You've seen the meticulous effort to make our buildings great. You hear and speak to some wonderful people in our offices. Um, you see every single day the support staff that makes our schools great. We have to incentivize those behaviors as well over time. We also realize that we should hear from those unions and have conversations with that. So in the very near future, we will set up some committees to start discussing what that could look like for the eight, I'm sorry, for the 1920 school year uh, and keep the motivation and the motivation pure around outcomes for kids and expecting excellence. So that's future initiatives. I'm sorry, and future incentives. Uh, the big five initiatives, I won't go too deeply in. This goes back to the big five things we're focusing on, kind of aligned to the standard-based grading pieces. Um, aligned to a lot of what we're trying to do around building uh, the future for our kids with the computer initiative. So I won't speak too deeply in this, but I will show you the five slides that we look at that allow us to see the progress against those five big initiatives, and you will see a common color. What's the color you see a lot of? <laughs> Red? It's natural. Beginning of the school year, we're still at the beginning of these, so I don't have a ton of updates for you on these, these five initiatives that are, are led district-wide, because we're just starting. On the operational side, the question always is, so how are you spending the money to get to do all of these wonderful things, right? It seems like you're, there's a lot of money, extra money being spent to get it done. But Josh has spent hours and hours with his team uh, looking at spreadsheets, and there are just some raw numbers I want to point out so you can see how we're doing financially. If you look up here, there's a couple different buckets. I apologize for it being so small. It's broken down into the big buckets. 80% of any district is usually salaries. Um, the rest is usually purchase services and other things around the fringes, to be general. Salaries in 2016 were uh, alone about $41 million, almost $42 million. And by 2018, we're now up to $45 uh, million. However, in between, you'll see from 16 to 17, which was two years ago, uh, we grew at about a rate of 5.1%, so we were growing at a pretty healthy clip. Last year, we actually slowed. We actually made a savings, we created a savings. So we actually grew slower than we typically do. And that growth is attributed to uh, the two and a half percent that people get like annually, um, and additional benefit pieces that actually wrap into that. Is that right, Josh, what's the second piece? You have the steps that are built into the contract. Steps, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you also have the uh, negotiated increase for the uh, salary grade itself. Right, so negotiated piece plus the steps equals that 3.54% uh, growth. Slowing growth, right, which is important because we're in a position where we constantly have to be fiscally conscious of what we're spending our money on. Another big question is we're spending more on administrative staff. We have all these new deans and all these other pieces. If you look at FY17 versus FY18, FY17, again, prior to the deans and all the new staff coming on, we were at about $7.69 million per year just for that staff. Um, if you look at FY18, we're at 6.9. So we actually decreased by 10% in spending on admin, right? So the narrative that we're spending more is actually not true. There's the numbers. Uh, the rest, again, are benefits and things that 
annually kind of increase over time. But the best part of this is just look at the bottom line and look at the rate in which our expenditures are going up. We cut the rate in which we were growing or spending in half. Just so you have that information as well. Any questions around finance? Sure. The next slide. <coughs> um, so, ooh, sorry, shouldn't have access there. Uh, so, a few things. So, great question. We built in time into the school year now, where I mentioned that um, those BLTs, RTI, and all those pieces. That was about 250, 260. I'm the administrators. I'm going to get there. I'm, I'm trying to give you the gap. So we said, you know what? We're going to take away those meetings and create that savings so we can pay for positions. So that's how we did part of that. The second piece is we reduced the number of additional blocks that we had in the high school that were costing us about $6,500 a piece. And all of that money that we were spending on that reduced that by, you know, we had like 23, 24 extra blocks last year. I think we're down to three this year. So it creates a big savings. Um, and for every ad, we've made a subtraction. Specifically, this year we um, got rid of Abbott. Um, and we got rid of another big program that cost all, all, all the title, all the Title One positions that were in place. So, so it sounds like this is just me speaking, and sure. I'm a teacher in the district, so I want to be honest. It sounds like you're you're putting more money in administrators, but you took away from the day-to-day -day needs of the children and the teachers, because it looks like you took away their meeting time, you took away extra blocks from the students, and you took away title, which mostly was spent on the children. Sure. For administrators. So let me let me give you those. Let's walk through each one of those. So we took away teacher time. Actually, we gave them more time. Okay, explain. So every Tuesday, early release is a half day. We never we didn't have this block of time last year. So instead of having a 45 minute meeting for BLT, another 45 minute for um, RTI, and another 45 minutes for um, PBIS, for example, that's 135 minutes of time we took away. Right. In in essence. We now have said, I think the last group that gets out is around 11.45 on other release, and they have until 3.30. So that math says to me, instead of an, uh, 135 minutes, we now have roughly about 265 minutes for teacher time that we didn't have last year. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna bring something up. I'm okay. just gonna be honest here, because I am a preschool teacher, so we have professional development, which is wonderful on those days. Okay. I'm not gonna be on PBS, I'm not gonna be on RTI, I'm not gonna be involved in any of this, because I am mandated to go to this professional development. So I see what you're saying, but in okay. reality, I'm not quite sure if it's working. And I'm not quite sure if it's best for the students to only come two and a half hours a day, right. feed them breakfast, feed them lunch, see you later, disrupt yeah. the parents. So I'll be quiet and now. I'll answer that. I don't yes. want to get fired. <laughs> because I have three children mm -hmm. that go to the Learning City School. Yep. I have two in the middle school and one in the elementary school. Sure. I work, I'm a student also, so guess what? My girls didn't go to school on Tuesday mm -hmm. because I have, to, I have to go to class, I can't miss class. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for me to pass accounting too for their future. Sure. So I had to keep them out of class and they don't go to daycare so they literally had a, a missed day of school. Yep. For yep. what? Yep. And, so, I, and I agree, yep. like I have two kids in school, that's why I'm here today. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. You either give them a day off or, or have a full day, one or the other. Mm -hmm. But I think it's completely inconvenient, and it was not thought of by the parents for the parents' sake mm -hmm. that you would drag my kids into school for two hours, mm -hmm. and then have the nerve to fit in breakfast and lunch mm -hmm. yeah. for what? Mm -hmm. So I didn't drug my kids to school for two hours. I didn't wasted my time, got them dressed, mm -hmm. and then they have to come right back home in two hours. There's nothing they were doing. His two hours in high school was free time. So you wasted my time. And so what will end up happening, like she said, is so that I'm not inconvenienced and so that I don't have to call off work, they won't go to school. So now they're penalized because they do like perfect attendance and they do like getting those awards because, and I'm not saying that the teachers shouldn't get the extra time. I'm saying that they, give them the day off then. Like yeah. that's what they did last year, they had a day off. Yeah, well last year we didn't have this structure. We didn't have this num these, as many days. What we're trying to do, to go to your, your point as well, we're trying to find that healthy balance of giving and having more time for teachers, whether it's professional development or additional planning time, to help. So when they do have your kids, 
um, that they're better off, right? Uh, we understand the drawback of that and saying like we're putting our parents in a position once a month uh, for a day to figure out childcare. Um, we get that. And so we realize, and we appreciate that feedback, and we realize we, this is the first time we've done it in a couple years. So I think a few years ago we had early release Tuesdays, and I believe. Was right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a thought of you know what is the you know what is the right balance of that, and what is the value of it. The good news is we also received and put out a survey to our teachers to get feedback on what could make that time better. Um, so we review that feedback very sincerely. And the same thing, I'm glad teach our parents are here so they can voice their concerns as well. If there is a way that we can move to a space where that's a, a full day off so that you don't have to drag your kids and, and all that good stuff, we will definitely evaluate that as well. Um, but please know we're trying to do, try to meet two needs, right? Uh, we're trying to ensure because the other situation we realize too, when we keep our kids out during the week, Sometimes that's the only meal our, some of our kids get. And I would hate for some of those kids not to have that situation. Now, not all, but some. So just know that it may sound like it's an easy, quick fix and a solution, but there's a lot of moving pieces. But I definitely appreciate the three perspectives, I think, that I heard here from a parent and also uh, from a teacher. Did the other piece. Did you ask before you started that? Did you ask for community input into how they preferred to do this with these two and a half hour yeah, we didn't even explore the whole day because we were um, concerned about the number of hours we needed to make sure that we had 178 days. We did. We, we made sure that we had the teachers union or teachers representation on the other side, so if we were moved to that. I know, I'm just answering both parts because someone said teachers over here. I just want to make sure I answered both parts. Um, so that that is what happened. Um, I do think it is a conversation on how we approach it going forward, but the feedback is, is very, very helpful. I wasn't asked. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know how many people were yeah. asked if we would prefer to have full day off or partial day off. Yeah, I think it actually went to vote by the teachers union. It had to be voted on, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, no, no, no. okay, yeah. I'll check with I the don't teachers think we union. I would have voted for this, honestly. Nobody okay. I talked to. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. I was. I actually have an email saying confirming. So I, I actually have to check with our. Yeah, we that's not a problem. Yeah. 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 No. yeah. yeah. Neither calendar no. choice offered that. So you did vote. If there was a calendar that was accepted by the union, it was because yeah. either option did not provide. So there wasn't. I'm confused. Was there a vote? I don't know. Oh, okay. The okay. whole union was voting. Oh, okay. Executive votes on. Oh, I see. I see. Executive votes on the calendar. Got it. Got it. Put out for that. Fair. Fair. I, I I assumed it was the entire union. It was the executive. Or BR. BR. I don't know who BR. Building well, building oh, okay. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yes. I'm glad you said that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I don't think everybody knows all that. Gotcha, I apologize. Um, but that's helpful context, knowing that it wasn't something that it was an entire union vote. It was something that was, sounds like executive team or, or building reps. Okay, okay, very fair. Um, but I want to finish your question, though. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> because I think this is also, um, it's really just a, I wish I had a chalkboard to kind of walk through how that all worked. So by moving away from title teachers, a number of them went to the classroom, which I think is awesome because we needed them in our classrooms. Um, some of them went on to be a dean. So by moving the title teachers to one of those positions, it actually created a savings because we just had a void. There's no no folks in title, so that actually created a ton of savings there. So you still have less teachers. But it's less interaction with less so, teachers per classroom. Well, per actually, year. actually, that's interesting you said that because uh, right now, looking at our data, we have about 5,874 kids in butts and seats. Enrolled in our district are 6,674 kids, and as we look at the difference in that number, on average we're down about 20 to 25 kids in every school building. So I had this conversation, and, and Jay and I have been working hand in hand to really think through this, and I told him that we're in a position, like if I were to just email him today, I said, Jay, we're down, our enrollment is down. And if I had to go meticulously school by school, I would be able to cut at least one teacher from eight out of 10 of the elementary schools, and in some cases, two or three out of middle. And high school, right now, our enrollment's down 369 kids. So if you take those numbers, those equivocate to teachers. I'm not touching them, because I know the value of having that extra body in schools every single day. So even though it feels like there's less, please trust and believe that the numbers shake out and show that I should be actually reducing teachers right now. Well, our classrooms are packed at my school. Yeah. I would love to hear your school and what, what the classes look like and, and see where we are. We don't have any extra bodies. 
Yeah, yeah, I would love to love to hear and see. So I, I'd love to follow up with you later about that. So with that said, those are the shifts we made. The other real, the other piece that people don't realize, we had a, a role as assistant principal funded last year. They rolled over the position kind of just allocated to deans. So when you look at the math, it actually matches out pretty well in a way that we actually created a little bit of savings along the way while out, without minimizing the impact on schools from the school leadership piece. And given what I said around enrollment, being that it's down, having cut teachers, we're still okay. Any other questions around that? Not Lee. around that, but around the, as you say, do you have a two or three year projection on where we will be financially within the next two years? I have a five year. You have a five year, okay, that's even better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I have to produce a five year forecast twice a year, and it's, they, it'll be updated in October but I just did an update in, ten, uh, in May. So okay. every May and October, I have to update that. Okay, that's including staff, teachers? Everything's in there. Everything? Yeah. Oh, and it's, it hasn't been yet finalized, is that what you're Not for October, about? but May is available. I have May available on my website, on the okay. school website, on my page. And so perhaps if someone really wants to come in and see that and get oh, that yeah. information. Oh yeah, I welcome anybody to sit, I'll so sit down with anybody. So we'll have an idea of where we are in five years from now and <coughs> we need a levy or whatever. And actually the numbers that he showed up there, um, when it comes to salaries, the one thing I want to point out is, on average, just based on contracts, the step and the percentage increase okay. with a two and a half percent, I mean, you're looking at a four and a half, five percent increase just with that alone. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at that, that 5.17 is a about the standard if you continue like normal year-to-year -year growth in salary number and that's just like normal inflation okay. so to, to be dropping the to the 3.5 percent that we are that's that's huge to move that much percentage wise and not grow at the extent considering you still have the percent increases mm -hmm. per all the union agreements and things like that that's a big swing uh, it seems like small because it's only percentages but when you're talking about $45 million, that's a couple million dollars. I mean, that's a big <coughs> swing. That's a big swing, and I think our community needs to know that, you mm -hmm. know, and how it's affected. Mm -hmm. the, the other reality, too, and, and again, go back to the iceberg, right? All the things that are happening underneath um, the, the tip of the iceberg. We also realize in a few years, the projection actually tells us a very different story around how our revenue will come in and, and how much money we'll actually have and that it will <coughs> decline. So every chance that we're able to sit down and Josh and I probably bump into each other in the hallway, I, I don't know how many times a day to talk through these things, literally, um, we're trying to figure out how can we continue to shave a little bit off here, a little bit off here, because we realize we will be at a deficit at some point. And we have to do whatever we can to minimize that deficit given the current circumstances. Okay, hence why you're seeing the, the reductions that we're trying to make over time. Um, lastly, something that's coming up soon, um, there's another piece around just newness of people. Sort of to your question, there's all these new administrators, we don't know who these folks are. Um, we wanna set up a space for our chiefs to come chat with you. Um, whether it be at a lunch or just a space where you might be eating, where we can just be a part of your environment and sit and talk with you. Last year I was able to get to a couple schools and have um, chat and choose with, with teachers at lunch. And I think the, the chiefs wanna do a very similar and intentional piece where they can just talk to you, understand the challenges that you might be seeing or facing or hearing, so we can do something about it really quickly. Um, principals I think can attest to uh, today when they had a restorative circle around some of the things that were discussed, went in with one understanding of what we were gonna do and then we came out with a very different one after hearing their feedback. And so that same intentionality is what we want to get from our teachers and our chiefs, being some of them all in this, ironically, in this front row and there in the back, uh, will be a part of those uh, conversations. Um, we also started a, um, ignore that bottom quote there, but we also started a, um, just a FAQ space for people to give us some feedback on our questions that they have. And the only questions we really received were around uh, teacher incentive and around that attendance piece. Um, the big answer to all of this is it's proposed and we have to wait until we hear back from the teachers union. So I don't know if it's executive or BR or the entire body, but that's... Yes, that'll be the entire body. It'll be, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so we're just waiting for that before it goes in effect. That was the big question. But uh, Sarah, 
Um, where can they find? It's on, the, it's on our website, um, and you can, and it's, or you can email info at um, LorainCitySchools.org, or if you want to uh, do the FAQ, it's on the website on your page. On the Lorraine Promise uh, page. Lorraine Promise page. Right. So two places. Go to Lorraine Promise page. Go to FAQ, or you can email info at LorraineCSD.org um, to ask your questions. Because we review those questions and hopefully get you those those answers. Now, any additional questions or co uh, conversation from you? I know we answered a lot along the way, um, but is there anything else that you would like to speak to? Yes, ma'am, and then I'll come up here. Some of the information that you're giving parents now, as far as their feedback, how have you addressed this to parents so they'll understand what the numbers mean when they see them on that report card? Is there anything that you're going to offer them so, you know, these are going to come out Yep. A um, few avenues. One, we want to be able to communicate it here. We'll also make sure that this video is live so people can always review it. Our MAC team does a tremendous job of re-sending out information so parents can access this conversation. The third piece is we have something we're calling like the mini, the mini book for parents. It's about two or three pages on standard-based grading that we'll send out. The third piece is we also want to have conversations with our families that have questions. So we'll have some of those like, hey, I still don't understand this. You know, we understand that this is new. Great, talk to us about it. So we can help parents understand along the way. The good news is when you think about an interim, it's, it's not the full blown situation, it's, it's just the interim. So they can have the chance to kind of understand it, grapple with it a little bit, ask us questions so we can improve. So that's the process that we're taking. Okay, I just want to oh. see a lot of opportunities for parents to get the answers. Absolutely. Before they start trying to deal with what does this mean anymore. Yeah, I think we, in theory, how we've done the uh, laptop days where we had like 11 different times where parents, you know, that's the kind of the focus and attention we want to put on, on this very similar thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Hardy, I know you've addressed this before, but could you address this to other people? Sure. As the reason why you do not, uh, you have not yet attended a school board meeting. Yes, absolutely. So why don't I attend a school board meeting? You know, it's funny. There's a few th reasons why. And if my computer was connected, um, uh, to the laptop right now, I would actually, I've, I've actually thought about it. I, I think a lot about adult psychology and how things work. And I went to this website just to research, like maybe I'm not thinking about this interaction the right way. And I went to a website that kind of outlined um, the tendencies of people that are uh, attempting to put people in difficult situations. Um, and I went to this and it had these characteristics of people where name calling and um, spreading of misinformation and uh, creating fear are indications of people who do those things and you should not give those folks in, uh, attention. Because when you do, you actually become going tit for tat in this situation mm -hmm. and I refuse to be in the middle of tit for tat given all the things we have to work on. Mm -hmm. And so my thinking is given, I would love to know after a board meeting you know, that it was a good conversation and you know, Names weren't productive, called right? productive, productive, right? Productive, productive, productive conversations, right? <laughs> and um, unfortunately, some of those headlines and some of the things quotes you see, mm -hmm. I can't argue are productive. Um, if I could see that they were productive, and it seems like, hey, they're inviting a conversation that makes sense, that it will be fruitful, productive, I would, I'll be open arms, be willing to talk with them. The second piece is, way back in October, November, I actually asked, hey, let's just talk. And I wish I can get to my email right now so I could show you this. I asked them, can we just talk? The response I received was, I don't have the authority to do it. Honest to truth. So I, you know, there's been attempts to speak. There's been other attempts to like just see and watch the actions. And we all know as adults, when you feel that you're gonna be attacked, you're probably not gonna walk into that room. And I don't wanna be attacked. I don't want our, our folks that work so hard every single day to be attacked. And unfortunately, Josh, uh, is on the side of it has to be the treasurer to make sure money is, is discussed, has to be there, but outside of that, I choose education over politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try? Mm. Try. Try even with them. Yes, I just mentioned. Yeah, so what oh, I was... I mean, previous to your... Oh, absolutely. So way back in August, my first meeting when I was hired was with the board president. First meeting, got off my plane, ran to a meeting, right on Oberlin Avenue at that restaurant. I can't remember what the top of my head. Um, had a meeting with him. 
Um, then we said, okay, let's have a couple successive meetings. Uh, we attempt to have uh, those meetings, another ADC member, myself, and two board members. And at one point I thought we came to just a kind of an understanding of how we could operate. Um, it kind of flipped at some point for whatever reason. Um, and I'm not placing blame. Well, if you feel like you cut off their legs so they don't want to feel like, why should they talk to you? Took away all their ability to make decisions about. Well, unfor decisions. unfortunately, I didn't yeah. take it away. I, I so right so well, it wasn't. They they took you know, you in the position of the person they're going to blame for it. Yeah, I under, I mean I understand that, and I completely get it from the side of like the the the, the powers to be, whoever it might have been, put this house bill in place and took away and stripped away the authority of those individuals. <coughs> Hence, let me just finish if I could. Um, and took away those authorities, fair? I mean, at, 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 the, at best. At worst, it's like, wow, we no longer have any ability to impact the well-being of our kids. Mm -hmm. And they bring in a person who's not from here, right. right? And so all those factors, I completely understand and I empathize with our board who, who are experiencing that, on, I honestly am. I think the, the challenge that become, you know, when we attempted to have these conversations last spring, it became very clear, I, I'm on a clock, right? I understand that we have five years to impact change for kids, and we have five years to do it so that whatever the next legislation is doesn't become even more devastation than this one, right? And so I understand that I have time that I can dedicate to individuals to have these conversations, but then when, again, you read the headlines and see how things are kind of shaping up and what is said, you realize, man, that's really hard to keep going back and saying, you know, you're a liar, and then walk up to say it to them and say, you know what, let's have a conversation. So I say all that to say, I don't think there isn't an opportunity to continue to fill, I figure out how to build that relationship, but in all honesty, there is so much work to get done for our kids that I need to prioritize that. Yes, I, one more second, because I saw, thought I saw another hand. Go ahead. If we would go back and we're talking about House Bill 70, if you remember a number of you here a number of years ago, when I stated the fact that it was coming, okay, and nothing was done in terms of stopping it. We did not band together, go to the legislature to let them know that we did not want this to happen and why it was happening. Uh, and it, I think it's unconstitutional, the way and the process that was done, but that we had elected board members to be representative of our students and to see that they had the type of quality education that they needed, okay? But then no one did anything or said anything. So then when the state came in with the stress commission, then we wanted to after the fact, and Dr. Hardy came here, even at the point that Dr. Graham, some of the things that Dr. Hardy is, is showing us, he showed and had the statistics to line up what was happening within our Lorraine City School District. Uh, the powers that be, and we know who they are, uh, there is a move on and it's still on to privatize education. Once you all begin to let that sink in and what is going to happen then, then you will understand why all of this has come about. Stop and think and realize what's mm -hmm. going on around us nationally. And this isn't something what that think is that? Dr. Hardy's fault. My thing is that you can't blame him, you can't blame one, but you don't begin to throw stones because it's a dereliction of our board members that we elected of their duty as it relates to our children. And I'll say that, and I am very unhappy about some of the things that I've seen to the point where I've wanted to cry. I have been out here, well, I won't tell you how many years, but, <laughs> but it's something that we need to come together as a community and as parents. And believe me, you all sit here and you're talking about what's going on, but believe me, there's some mamas and papas out there I want to smack. <laughs> because they are not doing the things that I think they should be doing for their children in terms of getting these children educated, taking care of them and their needs. Yeah. And that's where I'm coming from. That stuff out there that you see and that they're doing, and I will tell you, look at the real deal, okay? Thank you. Sir.
Mm-hmm. But I think it's important for the parents to comment. I mean, they re- be honest with you, I think some of the last few posts were our newspaper articles were just negative to our community. And it had nothing to do with the school. And so then the parents read that, you know, the social media posts. But this is an opportunity for them to come, but it's always staff, but it's not really with our parents. So yeah. how are they informed? I'm actually curious. I want to turn it over to our Mac team in a second. But mom, how did you find out about tonight's meeting? Uh, I went to the website. Website. The Ray City School website. Okay. Um, and I, I was, but only looking for your presence in particular, okay. and this one was your presence. Okay. So that's how I did it. Okay. So website is one. Mom, how did you find out? I had a um, text notification on my phone. Okay. Oh yeah, I got that too. Recording. Mm-hmm. Oh, you got the text okay, notification yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. So website, text notification. I know a lot of parents in my neighborhood are minutes right now, so they might not. Okay. <laughs> 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 so what I do here, what I do here, I mean, honestly, I, what I hear you saying, Councilman, is um, it is land, air, and sea. So we might have been able to get people to the website, might have gotten people by text message, but we can, should continue to reach out to them. I think there's a few other things that we have also done to make sure that we got it out to, to parents. And um, robocall, which may not answer the question, but there was a robocall also sent out about the, the event. Sir? Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Yes, sir. Um, I really like what I see thus far in this change of administration. From previous years to now, I see a big improvement. One of the improvements that I see um, that I was real proud of was when we had uh, the computer day, mm-hmm. and that day we came to the auditorium and I saw all those computers up there. <coughs> it felt like we were coming up with the world. That's the feeling I got, just being honest with you. I felt like we were a part of the world, and we are learning the skills of today. Mm-hmm. That's one. Two, I feel like with the standards being ready, because I have children in the district, and I'm a teacher as well, so I see both sides. I'm glad to know that my child is learning something that means something. I don't want my kid to get a good grade because they brought a box of tissue to class. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I'm just saying this because of, I'm being open mm-hmm. and I'm not afraid to speak my mind, okay? But these are my real thoughts, okay? So, the state wants to know, can you do X, Y, Z? All I wanna know is can my child do X, Y, Z? Period, mm-hmm. nothing else. Mm-hmm. So these these implementations of the standards-based grading, I'm really feeling that. I'm really understanding that. And I'm trying to um, implement it in my job as well because I deal with special needs kids and it's kind of hard for them. But I'd rather them do less work with more rigor mm-hmm. than to do more work with less rigor. Mm-hmm. And I'm really feeling that. Great, thank you. And the transparency. Mm-hmm. You have been more transparent mm-hmm. than ever before in this district. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. And that. we can see that, I can see it, and that is big, that's huge to me, because it lets people know what's going on, why it's going on, Et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate that. And and I, I really appreciate that for the folks that work in our office who there are times when we feel like we're running a million miles per hour and doing trying to do a million things right um, and work so hard, whether it's central office or our school buildings every single day, um, trying to do right by kids. So I, I thank you for saying that, more so for the people that are here who experience the challenges every day but realize the work does pay off for comments like that. Yes. I have a question. Um, sure. I'm not a teacher and I'm not a parent. I, um, my friend who had to leave, we actually go into Success Academy Great. and mentor some of the girls in the program. Thank you for doing um, it. It's, it's a blessing and a joy to do it. Um, but my question is, I get to hear the teenage side of the program, yeah. but coming from you, I was just curious as to 
are they actually only there for half days? I ran up, they don't have a science teacher. So I was just curious to hear from your side yeah. of view of what actually is going on and yeah. some of the changes that they're experiencing. Cause I know they seem a little upset about it, but yeah. I just wanted to hear from your side too. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're putting it very nicely. I think they're very upset for a lot of things. First day of school, I had actually had a chance and sat with all of them to kind of hear their side. Um, and let me just go back to last year and I promise I'll come back to your question for this year. Um, when I got here last year, I don't know, were you, did you mentor last year yeah, as well? Yeah, like the end of, like uh, more second semester. Okay, okay. So you experienced the space that they were in yeah. last year. Yeah. And more than anything that was devastating for me is for us to send kids there every single day and expect them to come out happy, joyful, and in a better place. It was just completely unfair. So step one, let's get them into a better space. Mm -hmm. Now, in that transition, I think the other challenge was we have to get them more resources. And we're still figuring that out, honestly. So to answer your question, do they have all the pieces they need and or deserve yet? We're getting there, we're not there yet. The first big step was getting them into a place where they can feel like I belong. Yeah. Um, the second piece uh, was very important. And one of the first things they said, which was something we fixed pretty quickly, they said, well, look, we're, we're in this space. At least give us our computers because they were fearful that they weren't even going to get computers. And within days, kids were getting their computers. Now, granted, there's a few. There's a few that I even spoke to today, uh, Jamie, that's who I'm speaking to, um, who needs their parent to come in to help them get it. And we're trying to figure out a system to help them make sure they get their technology and the things that they deserve. Uh, the third piece around their schedule. Their schedule was actually created to do a couple of different things. Um, for some of our kids, the reality is they're also working. They're in another space. And we try to create a schedule to make them, entice them enough to come to school, because to be honest, um, hundred I think there's 138 kids that are on the books for Success Academy, and on any given day, it's about 45 that actually show. I mean, you're there, you see how many are there, right? And so we were trying to find a way, we'll say, you know what, we're gonna shorten this day, and we're gonna help you get to work. Literally, like find you jobs. Has it worked yet? Not yet, honestly. Yeah. But it's a work in progress. We've, uh, we have two dedicated individuals to help with that. One of them is in the back of the room, Mr. Montague, who is helping us build the culture there. The second is Coach McFarland. And if you know anything about mm -hmm. Coach McFarland, he can motivate people, right? And so when you have those two gentlemen motivating our kids to come to school and then uh, helping them find jobs, it's a powerful match. So we're working with, and I'm blanking on the name of the organization, um, Mr. Garvey, but through Mike Luongo, who's helping us identify jobs for our kids. So it's intentionally that they get the credits they need and get them to, to work. Um, what's that? Ohio jobs. Ohio jobs, thank you. Um, so that's the work in progress. The other piece that we realized, this is the third tier to this, some of our kids are literally a credit or two away. And so for them to spend their entire day getting a credit or two and then just hanging out is probably not the best thing. So let's get them to a space where they can be more productive. The other uh, reality is there's a number of kids who said, you know what, I want to be in the high school. So I want to work my butt off to show that I can do it here so I can now get to the high school. So all of that is going on in this transition um, while also realizing another sad reality in, in this a number of our kids are saying they have 16, 17 credits, but when they find out the credits that they actually need to graduate are in the single numbers of five and six of the 16, they're heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly believe that wouldn't have come about if we didn't make this transition and get them closer to the high school. So I know it's an indirect way to answer your question, but I think those are all the pieces that surround the transition. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. You're very welcome, anytime. Seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. And on all honesty, you know, to go back to where we started, um, change is hard, but it's necessary and needed if we're really in this to make sure that our kids are successful. And I'm so proud to see the village that came tonight to talk about this and have a dialogue, whether it was, we weren't always happy, but there was moments where we were honest. And that goes a long way for us to get where we need to be. So I appreciate all the voices that share their perspective. Whether or not um, the answer was the one you wanted to hear, please know it was just the honest one. Um, so I thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for sharing in honesty. Have a safe trip home.